Hello, welcome. This is uh, Data Science Feature Engineering, another one of the sessions at the Data Platform Summit 2020. This one's going to be focusing on the Team Data Science Process, TDSP, and also something called Principal Component Analysis, PCA. I'm Neil Hambly. I'll be your presenter and instructor for this session. Myself, I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer. I'm a consultant in the data platform world. I founded a company called Beacon Intelligence uh, a couple of years ago and we're a Microsoft Gold Partner around the data analytics space. I've been working with databases and data platform technologies for well over 20 years now, back in the late 90s I started. And I do a lot of community work as well. I've been kind of uh, involved in community for over 10 years, but this is the first time I've done any sessions at the Data Platform Summit, although it's one of the ones I wanted to attend for many years just the timing of it in the year and my other commitments didn't allow me. But this year being it virtual means I can definitely be on that roster. So it's good to be here. I'm glad I can kind of join you for this one of the sessions. I know there's an amazing spread of sessions, especially around the data science space. So I'm hopefully going to fit nicely into the rest of those sessions as well. So let's go see what we have lined up for you in my session. Okay, here's a quick agenda of what we're gonna cover. It's very straightforward, we're covering the team data science process, we're going to explain what that is, where feature engineering specifically inside of that process fits, so we're focusing on a certain part of that process. And principal component analysis also, we'll explore what that is. We're going to tell you also something about something called the exploratory data analysis, essentially visualizing and analyzing the data in order to understand it better, so we can prepare it for our machine learning kind of programs later. And we're going to do some Jupyter Notebook examples Going to jump into some of those. I'm going to show you some of the workshops that I've currently deployed for Microsoft and also some of the information I did uh, in a recent session at Past Summit around the data science process as well. So I'll give you links to some of the material you can actually go and see a bit more detail about this. But let's get started with what we have in store for you right now for this session. So team data science process, let's explore uh, what this is all about. So Firstly, it was launched in 2016. It's an agile, iterative data science methodology. It's kind of grown out of something called the CRISP DM. And I explore that in one of my other sessions. I'll give you the links to that later. But we don't have time to go through all of that background information now. But it's a methodology that allows us to approach doing predictive analytics, data science work as a team and being able to follow a process and understand the nature of that process, how it's circular, how it kind of goes back on itself several times in order to get that final kind of result in terms of the accuracy of the models that we're going to deploy. So that's really cool. That's what we need to focus in on. So we've got a data science life cycle definition. We've got a standardized project structure as part of this. There's some specific infrastructure resources such as DevOps and other tooling that we may need to be part of that. So we're going to explore the four major components sit around data science process, but we're going to have a focus today specifically on the feature engineering components. So we'll look at that a little bit on further in the session where we go into some demos and into some more detail about that. So let's kind of frame up what we have in front of us right now. You can see the data science live process on the screen now. Now at the top we have a business understanding that's framing the questions that we want to ask. That's really important. If you don't do that right, there's no point doing the whole process in the first place. So everything that follows is going to be of no value if you don't get that framing of those questions right. What is it we're trying to ask of the data? Now, we do have to go and get that data, bring it in, create our environments and everything else. And that's called the data acquisition and understanding. And we're going to focus a little bit on that today in terms of preparation of data. So we're going to have some data sets we're going to need to prepare transform to say data frames in pandas in order to kind of utilize that and the main focus we're going to have today is in the modeling phase where we're going to do the feature engineering so you look on the screen there you see the feature engineering is feature selection transformations and all those tasks we're going to explore some of that today but there's other aspects to that modeling as well we've got the engineering we've got the model training and we've got the model evaluation and we, of course, will have deployment after that, and that's going to be the scoring, the performance, and the deployment of that, as well as kind of having the customer kind of accept the, the model and make use of it. So there's a, a big process here, but we're focusing on a couple of items here. 
what we're going to do is we're going to lay out here very quickly kind of where the um, different parts of that who does the different roles as well so if you're a solution architect or project manager whether you're a data engineer or scientist maybe an application developer or project lead you have a certain role in this overall kind of arching project but we're going to focus in on the data engineering data science kind of parts of this today and the data acquisition and understanding so we've got to focus in on just these couple of tasks here so if you look there the data ingest and explore and the feature engineering are the two that we're going to focus in on and if you go back a screen for a second you'll see that that's in the second tier and then it kind of follows in we notice there's some kind of looping going back so we may do uh, some model development we may go back and do some more feature analysis and explore exploration and then go through that cycle several times until we get to the right end result so we're going to focus in on data engineer and data scientist roles these are the types of tasks that these two roles will do in order creating and exploring that data and making that data ready in order to explore it further before we do that we're going to go through and explore what the tdsp process is so first one remember right at the top business understanding the goals here are to define what the model what the model targets are and what the related metrics are that we need to ensure the success of the project we can't write that down we can't measure it we don't know if we have a successful project we will also need to identify the relative data sources that are going to be needed in order to make sure this is successful so that's going to be really key for us to understand the key variables the targets and measurements of uh, that so which metrics are we going to use and where the data is so we have to have two tasks addressed in this stage the first one is define the objectives write that question out formulate that question maybe go through as a group and kind of uh, succinctly figure out what it is you want to do you may have more than one question if that's so write those multiple questions down but be careful that you don't go too wide you want to have one or two maybe three questions maximum defined in the project okay so that's going to be what you need to do and you need to make sure that it's going to be relevant to the end user it's not like um, driving it by the technology you want to drive it from the business side what's the business asking can we then create the infrastructure the model etc in order to define that question so in order to do that we're going to need to identify the data sources now you may have all the relevant data to hand it might be easily accessible but otherwise you might need to go and do a bit of research and you may find you need to do um, some additional data sources that you're not really thinking of right now when you first start the project to help narrow it down and also give you additional supporting information supporting data in order to make sure that the answer that you're going to get out of this um, project is going to be successful so business understanding is number one let's make sure we do that correctly and we have two tasks define objectives identify data sources let's go in and just kind of give us a bit more of a look into that define objective so it's the central objective is to identify the business variables as I said earlier and what we're trying to predict is it trying to predict a yes no how many likelihood of somebody maybe defaulting on a loan are they going to likely want to buy this product again in six months time so we're trying to define it and trying to make it as sharp as possible kind of uh, make those relevant and ambiguous really kind of defined questions so generally we want to find it's going to be one of five types of questions how much or how many and this is kind of falling into the regression algorithms we also have which category so that's our classification the groupings of um that's sorry the category that is which group which category does it fall into we also have clustering which group does it fall into so when we kind of have groups of data which one is going to be the one that this data value is going to sit in nicely is it weird we're talking about anomaly detection here not kind of the the odd characteristics you might have as a human i know i have plenty of those myself and which options should be taken so do we have any recommendation strategies so we have the different algorithms that we can kind of apply and we need to try and work out where our question falls into one of these types of questions so defining those objectives we need to understand also who's going to be responsible for what part of the puzzle 
Think about kind of a puzzle on a table, got a, say a couple of hundred uh, different parts of it. Now, somebody might be kind of creating that outer edge. Somebody might kind of be creating uh, specific kind of parts of the puzzle. Be working together to make that picture a whole, make that successful. So you need to define your plan to work out who's doing what part of that puzzle, breaking it down. And also, is there a sequence of order for these? You might be able to have to do some tasks, some parts of the puzzle before others are going to be able to be successfully done. And finally, we need uh, to define our success criteria. So let's say we need an accuracy rate of 92%. Our model, if it's over 92%, we're going to successfully believe that that is a good model. And we're happy to ship that out and have it used in the real world. It depends, depends on what kind of questions we're asking, what kind of data we have, whether the accuracy level needs to be a high percentage and also what type of false positive or false negatives we're allowed to have in there as well. And also, is that data going to change a lot over time? So potentially we might be uh, saying that data comes in and it's completely different last week to this week. Maybe the orders that people have uh, processed uh, change very rapidly. We may have customers that are going to churn on us. We want to understand what kind of promotions we can help to keep them with us as a customer. But all the metrics must be smart. That is, they must be specific. They have to be measurable. Realistically, they've got to be achievable as well. Uh, they need to be relevant and time bound. So as long as they're smart type of metrics, we're going to be able to measure those and understand whether they're going to fit our needs or not. And if we fall short, we go back and we have another iteration. And two, maybe we get to the point where we're happy with the performance and then we can release that. So these are the things we're trying to achieve with this, okay? And identifying data sources was the other item on that that we were looking at. And we want to find out what's relevant. So let's look at the question we have. Let's look at the data we have. And let's see if we can kind of find relevant data and features within that data that are going to allow us to kind of get the outcome that we want. And we're going to also train the data and test the data. So we're going to split some of the data into a train and test in Percentage. Maybe 70% is training and 30% of the data we have is going for testing. And as new data comes in, it's going to then be processed through that model and the uh, prediction is going to be made. So we now need to figure out how to maybe cleanse and update our data in order to make it relevant and kind of timely and updated before we get started with the project. So is there any kind of back end work we need to do to kind of get the data to a good starting point essentially? You probably heard that phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Very much uh, applicable to this type of project. If we don't have good data coming in, we can't expect to have good results coming out the other end. For each of these phases, we're probably going to generate what we call artifacts, which is essentially documents and kind of uh, different kind of assets that we're going to build. So one of those might be a what we call a charter document, and it generally is a templated type of approach where we have this kind of definition of what the project is and what we're trying to achieve, uh, what the business requirements are, if changes happen, how they affect the process. And we're going to iterate on that. We're going to add to that. It's a living document, as they call it. So over time, we're going to make it more kind of verbose, more detailed, more accurate, probably. And over time, we're going to clearly communicate what the project is, what the outcome is, and it needs to be able to kind of be picked up very quickly and somebody doesn't have to wade through hundreds of pages of documentation in order to understand what the project is. It needs to be clearly defined. So we need to make sure we're doing that right and also communicating changes as they happen to all the stakeholders and customers involved. For the data sources, we're going to have a raw version of the data. I, the original data as it comes in, probably um, the word kind of unclean, it's not great, it's not the best data in terms of quality. We need to do some work on that. And that's where we're going to spend some time doing some of the PCA, principal component analysis, helping cleanse the data, de-dimensionalize it so it's kind of easier to visualize and understand maybe the attributes of the data better. 
but we're going to have the daily sources and we're going to probably have a number of folders as it goes through the stages like a raw folder a pre-process a process maybe a final um kind of um data set as well and some reporting of data that, that as well so over time we're also going to version that data so as new data comes in maybe kind of have different versions of the data we're going to process through and data dictionaries is all about describing what that data is so we can understand the schema the data types and other relevant information maybe the source of the data all that kind of lovely information we need maybe some diagrams are going to be put in there and we're going to build all of this as part of that business question phase okay so you want to kind of understand exactly what's happened what we defined and how things are going progressing so that's our business description uh, phase we kind of put forward now we're getting on to some of the more fun stuff so this is kind of where generally i would um think most people think about the project starting is the data acquisition and understanding for me it's earlier on it's the business understanding and kind of defining the question of the project in the first place but we got to stage two data acquisition and understanding this is exactly where we're going to start bringing that data in where is it it's in this database it's in this file here it's in this excel file it's in this website it's some streaming data whatever the data is we need to ingest it and bring it into the analytic environments that we kind of be able to process. We're going to then explore that data. Is the data quality good? If not, how do we get it to a better quality? What feature engineering do we need to do on this data in order to make sure that it's right for the next stage? And we're probably going to set up some pipelines in order to get that data refreshed, etc. And that's too much outside of today's scope, but something like ML ops or DevOps um, around the data is going to be needed something like Azure Data Factory and the DevOps, uh, maybe repositories, GitHub, all of these resources are going to be needed in order to get to the point where we can process this through. And we're going to use technologies such as maybe the machine learning uh, service and maybe a data science VM and Jupyter and notebooks and there's lots of stuff there. But we need to develop a solution architecture of the pipeline of data, getting it in maybe to something like Azure Data Lake Store, ADLS, in order to go forward from that point. So let's go and see how we do that. So ingesting data, we're going to load data in, we're going to probably bring data in from Blob Storage, SQL Server, Synapse Analytics, Azure Machine Learning Services, that could be data stores or data sets, could be websites, the list is pretty much endless. And there's so many connectors out there. But we have a few kind of main ones that we would do, maybe bringing it in and from Blob Storage, from SQL Server and Azure VM or Azure SQL Database. Some hive tables that might be in one of the kind of NoSQL databases or a SQL partition table in something like Azure Data Warehouse and also on-premises SQL and other databases like Oracle, and CRM systems, etc. So we've got a vast array of different um, kind of ingestion options, and we'll be able to kind of bring that data in and process it through. Once we have the data, it's time to put on those binoculars and those microscopes and start looking at the data from a high level down to a more kind of detailed data perspective. The things we're trying to figure out is do we need to do any pre processing on data? If so, what do we have? Do we have missing values, incomplete data values? Do we have basically what we call noisy data? So data that's got like lots of outliers and errors in it. And how do we deduplicate that data or kind of uh, resolve those, those issues? And inconsistent. Sometimes we have the complete record of all the values in all the rows and columns. And other times it's missing some of that. And that could be due to timing or other issues we need to figure out how do we handle those scenarios? How do we f handle nulls in our data set? How do we handle kind of values that are missing? Do we want to kind of put a, a kind of different value in? Do we want to kind of have a default value? Do we need to go back and say, no, unless we've got all the data for that record, we can't use it. And then we may not have enough data in order to process. So there's a number of tasks that we're going to do in the pre-processing phase. One, 
of these would be called daily cleansing. So that's what's the missing values? How do we fill those in? How do we detect that we have those? What's the noisy data and the outliers? So what's the data cleansing that we need to do? Do we have a cleaned data set at the other end that's allowing us to take the next step? Transformation. Now this is normalization of the data. This is getting the data, maybe reducing the number of dimensions. So you say you have a hundred columns. That's a lot of columns, a lot of features to deal with. So we want to maybe normalize that and standardize that down to a better, smaller kind of data set that we can handle better. So we want to perform some transformation, normalization on that. We're also going to maybe just, just to do a, a data reduction. We want to take a sample data set. We want to take last month's data. We don't need the 10 years worth of data. We're going to look at last, last month's data. So we want to look at that from a number of reasons, maybe just for time or expense, um, or it's just relevant to have that smaller data set. We're going to also do some conversion of some of the attributes to categorical attributes so they're usable with some machine learning methods and algorithms so we may need to do some kind of transformations here okay so that's something also we need to do and potentially also text cleaning so we want to take all those additional kind of space characters out there and kind of end line characters we may want to remove errors uh, spelling errors that is potentially we might want to put line breaks in or tab se separate it there's a number of different things we want to do maybe with the text so we're going to need to be able to take our data and pre-process it and get to a clean data set sounds good to me let's see what the next step is so this is really kind of how we deal with the missing values specifically do we remove the whole row if we have a value missing in any of the columns? Are we going to replace the values with maybe a substitute value? So maybe the average mean, standard value, zero, for example. All these options are available to us. Let's look at which ones we want to use here. We've got these different substitutions, regression, frequent, mean, maybe going to do the last value previously. So kind of think about like an Excel file where you drop down and suddenly you get some nulls and then you have another value and maybe you've got five or six missing nulls. Do you kind of do a drop down? So you take the last value and fill it down. Do you fill it up? Do you take an average? Do you have a default? So all of those are options available for us. The normalization stage is where we rescale everything so that it kind of is easy for us to then um, apply in the machine learning algorithms. So we have decimal scaling, we have the Z score normalization, the min max normalization. We don't have a lot of time today to go through all the details here, but we need to go through probably at least one of these scaling um, normalization methods in order to get the data in a kind of right sizing. So you don't have a massive scale on one and tiny scale on the next one, that's going to blow everything out completely. We need to kind of rescale it um, so it's more standardized. So we won't go through all the details today, but we put in here a, a note to, to the scaling on that. Okay, so now we're going to look at how to uh, reduce our data. Now there's a number of different techniques we can apply to do that, but you know, one of those is going to be recorded or sampling of the data or providing aggregation. So we may need the detailed information. We might need to do it at a summary level, aggregate maybe at day or month level or year level. Those are the kind of uh, groupings that we might need to perform our analysis on. So over time, we need to kind of figure out what's going to be the right strategy for reducing the data, maybe to get the data to a better size so that when we process it through and train the model, it's not gonna cost us a ton of money and we can done, be done in an effective time. But the accuracy level of the model is not going to be hugely affected by the kind of reduction in data. So that's important to note. We need to get the accuracy level high, but we don't need to go on and maybe go with all of the data at the most granular data possible in order to achieve that. So we need to figure out how we do that. And there's a number of different kind of sampling methods or binning methods in order to kind of group it down into kind of maybe different kind of, you know, one to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30 kind of buckets, 
maybe you're thinking about age groups, that kind of stuff. So we need to set up a data pipeline and you're probably gonna use something like Azure Data Factory for that. Uh, in my session at Summit, um, recently I did an ML ops where I used the Azure pipelines and kind of built those out. So there's different options available. Depends on the frequency of the data changes, how often the data is kind of being ingested, changing, whether you go with a kind of batch or streaming mode, whether you're going to do a hybrid of those, lots of options, okay? But what you end up need to do is work out how you're gonna get data in, fresh it. And it could be you're just dropping it into a folder somewhere in say Azure Data Lake Store. And then you have a new folder for every day and you pick up and process that maybe on a nightly run and your machine learning uh, model is gonna run overnight and reduce the outcome for the predictions. Perfectly good option, I've done that in many projects in the real world. So it depends on what you're trying to do and how frequently you need the data and the latency of the outcome of those results. So you could have potentially a real time and a batch mode for your processing. So you may have one or two records you need to process right now, and you're gonna throw them on a real time kind of inference uh, cluster there and get a result. Potentially you're gonna do a batch cluster of your process and you're gonna take lots of records and process them through and get the results in one batch or multiple batches. So again, like before, we got some artifacts that we're gonna develop out of this. Now there's something called the idea tool, which is part of the TSV process that can kind of build some reports for you. Um, I've never really used it to a great degree, but I wanna make sure you're aware that this thing exists. And it's a data quality report kind of tells us what's happening in relationships and attributes, etc. The solution architect diagram or kind of details in terms of uh, kind of you know, PDFs and icons and diagrams you're gonna build will kind of outline what the process is, what the solution is. You wanna store that somewhere that's easily accessible that's also going to be referenced and updated as changes happen. And you're going to also need to reevaluate a project at different phases of that. So in order to make sure that you're kind of ready and things are proceeding as they should do in terms of the project. So in this case, right now, we're bringing the data in. The outcome of this is we need to have the data ready in order to go into the next phase, which is going to put it into a machine learning model and process it. So we don't have ways of checking the quality and metrics that we can kind of find around that, then maybe we're just going to, just, um, yeah, we're okay with that, go ahead. I need some way of kind of qualifying a gating process of saying it's good enough or it's not. Okay, so this is kind of where maybe we also say, look, we don't have enough data. The data is not of good enough quality. Whatever it might be, we need a process that. So coming into maybe some of the more fun aspects of kind of doing the data science process is, is the modeling phase. So here we want to figure out what are the features that are optimum for the machine learning model we're trying to build which columns, which data values are going to provide us with the best way of kind of making those predictions. Remember, it's a um, not guaranteed 100% gonna be accurate. There's gonna be some variance in terms of how accurate this model will be. So we need to figure out the best way of getting to the highest level, probably the lowest cost of getting there. So there's always gonna be a bit of a trade off there. We're gonna to need to make sure that we have the right type of model and it potentially can learn and improve and get better as over time maybe as well. But it's gonna be suitable for production at the end of the day. There's no point building something that is unstable and unreliable and doesn't have the right kind of characteristics of being a stable production ready model. So that's important. Now there's three main tasks then in order to achieve that. We have the feature engineer, which is kind of why we're here today really. And we're going to move that raw data and we're going to facilitate it into a process data set. We can then throw into the model, churn the wheels, and out comes a nice prediction. We can then go, right, here's how we're going to act on that prediction. The model training is an important, expensive, and probably most complicated part of the phase, which is going to figure out which model is the right one for us. How is it accurate? How do we define that against the success criteria we did in the business understanding phase? And is it suitable for production? Not because Neil says it's suitable, but 
does the criteria of the success of the model and the test that we performed on it tell us it's suitable for production? Okay. So the feature engineering part. This is getting the transformation of that raw data into a state that's kind of ready for that analysis. So how do we do that? What are the best features? Which ones can we essentially ignore and kind of remove from the model because it doesn't have really that much relevance to the outcome prediction of it? So we do something called maybe a principal component analysis. We want to do reduction of dimensionality in order to kind of make sure, maybe we understand the top five features, top 10 features if there's a larger data set there that are going to apply to that. And we're going to look at some visuals, we're going to kind of understand it with some of the data preparation steps in Pandas and NumPy and machine learning algorithms to get that data ready. But the feature engine is a balancing act. It's taking the finding of the data and examine it and doing an exploratory data analysis on the data and doing some visualization to work out what we can kind of safely remove from the model to kind of make it smaller, more compact, more kind of um, suitable for putting through a machine learning algorithm. Machine learning algorithms work better with a few variables, a few features, rather than the hundreds of them. Otherwise, we just kind of throw the whole thing in and we you know, kind of churn it and get it out there. And so the more variables, the more complex your model has to be and more difficult it is to get the accuracy level because we may have correlated or uncorrelated features that need to be um, figured out. We need to remove the noise from that model as well. So all of these options are kind of required in order to get the other. So if you can do this part really well, likely is your model is going to be fairly accurate and the predictions will then flow out of that be accurate. There's no point building a really, you know, complicated model, spend lots of time on it, if the accuracy of the model just doesn't make sense to deploy. So we want to figure out how to generate maybe new features as well in order to figure out, let's think about a time specific one. You've got the timestamp. It's a date and an hour, minute, seconds value. But all I really want to know is what hour it falls into. Well, I can feature out of that date time value the hour of the day. It's 11 a.m. It's 4 p.m. I may want to figure out when my highest workload in terms of staffing levels need to happen based on the number of orders I'm taking. So, you know, how many staff do I need to kind of provision to kind of get the optimum kind of um, amount of time my customers are waiting. So 2 a.m. in the morning, not many customers are buying stuff. But maybe if I'm kind of, you know, cafeteria or something I'm kind of selling food maybe that kind of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. is my key time so I want to understand the ramp up for time I want to understand the usage of that over time so these are things that we need to figure out maybe do feature engineering on in order to get that result there. one of the biggest questions I get whenever I do all of these different workshops is okay I've got dozens and maybe you know different types of algorithms, even in just one category, even classification or regression, etc. How do I know which is the best model? Now, at the moment, you probably won't, and you maybe need to go through something like automated ML. It's going to test out a number of these different algorithms with the same data set in order to work out which one performed better. But we do have some kind of um, techniques and approaches to order figure out. We have something like the algorithm cheat sheet to kind of figure out which one maybe is the type of algorithm like classification, regression, etc. we're going to uh, need to kind of use. So we're going to show you that in a second. But ultimately, what do we want to do with our data? Um, and what amount of time, what's the accuracy, the training time, the linearity that may be, the number of parameters and features of the data, these all play into which is maybe a better algorithm than the others. Okay, so we're going to look at something called the machine learning algorithm cheat sheet. So I've got a link to this. I'll give you uh, guys the link to it as well. Basically, if you just search for that, you'll find this PDF. And it kind of kind of crunches down a little bit of the questions. Do I want to extract information from text? Yes, very top left, text analytics. Do I want to predict a value? Yes, okay. Well, it's going to be a regression algorithm as opposed to text analytics. Do I want to find unusual occurrences? 
anomaly detection. Maybe the PCA based anomaly detection algorithm is the one for us. And I'm going to classify images bottom right. And I'm going to predict between one category or multiple categories. Then I'm looking at the multi class classification or the two class classification, depends on which uh, number of classes you want there. And inside of each of those, you've got the amount of time that certain algorithms, the accuracy and the complexity. So you're going to first kind of pick a type of algorithm and then you're going to want to pick kind of maybe a couple of those in there. Over time, you'll probably get to know which are the better algorithms for your types of data, for your data sets, et cetera. So that's going to be important for you to uh, figure out their design. And when we look at the AutoML process inside of say, the Azure Machine Learning Service, we can pick the regression or classification or time series uh, ones as well. So moving on quickly, we have uh, the model training. We're gonna skip through a lot of the content here, uh, quite a bit to get to the demos in the time that we have. Accuracy, there's an evaluate model module inside of the designer part of the Azure ML service. We're gonna look at that very shortly. And, and basically in that, we're gonna work out the scoring accuracy level of that. So we wanna find the most accurate model and we want to maybe compare uh, that. So we need to perform a scoring operation on our models as we train them. And then we can kind of compare and contrast between others that may be, you know, help. And we obviously need to use the same data with the same kind of split of data. So the random seeding, that kind of stuff. But that's gonna be the evaluate model module. Training time, we can define something like in the machine in the world, Let's say we cap it two hours or one hour, or we can allow it maybe to go through a longer process. But dependent on the number of parameters and the amount of data you have, et cetera, and the number of modules uh, or kind of algorithms you're gonna play and process, you're going to need to work out what the kind of uh, amount of time is you're gonna need. So I kind of do a few simple ones, maybe a subset of data just to train the model and maybe come back once you've kind of narrowed it down to do a full data set process in order to get the model to kind of to be kind of you know across all the data and see if that affected the accuracy and you're going to take maybe an average of several runs also rather than just take one run and just kind of take that as gospel there's going to be other kind of parts of that and we're not going to cover those today because we just don't have time but um linearity and statistics kind of understanding the data how it fits to kind of linear models or kind of uh, other types of a kind of uh, you know graphing of that data, the accuracy of the data. Um, so if we're looking at linear regression algorithms, they're going to essentially kind of cause us to see these linear trends, but the data itself may be more of a kind of S curve um, in itself. So we want to understand that and then pick the right model uh, in order to define the type of data and process and the variance in the data itself over time. Parameters is going to be another aspect here, and that's going to be also in the Tune model, hyperparameters model. So that's the auto ML, auto ML. We're going to kind of say, here's some values, maybe uh, the regulation rate we're going to pass in. We're going to try a few different values that. So we have the different parameters, and we're going to tweak the knobs as we go and process. So that's what we're looking at here is how many of those and what's the different values that they need to have in there. So we're going to uh, need to no understand the number of parameters in our data set, in our model rather. Number of features, it's kind of going to be dependent on the type of data, the amount of data you have and all these processes to reduce it down to a certain number that's going to be usable by the model to give you the right accuracy, but kind of not going too overboard with too much variance too much number of features here so there's a, a number of algorithms that might help with uh, kind of uh, narrowing that down a bit and also we have the permutation feature importance module uh, a long word to say kind of that helps us with um, scoring of those different features there. again not a lot of detail on this right now purely for the amount of time you have we want to get to the demos but this is kind of a indicator for you to go and look into this a little bit more um, the filter-based feature selection module as well, and the support vector machines module. So have a look at those and see if they, uh, they kind of help understand that. There's a lot of also uh, good information in the Microsoft Learn modules out there around this stuff, okay. 
we build a model. Excellent. We want to deploy it. So we're going to have our production pipeline, something like ML Ops or some other mechanism of deploying to something like Azure Container Instance and AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service. Um, but we're operationalizing that model. Um, so that's taking that pipeline and saying it's going to dev test production. We need to maybe have some scoring dashboards to say, was that model successfully deployed into one of those areas? There's a lot of different services out there that can help you with that. But ultimately, you've got your data, you brought it in, you process that data, you cleanse it, got it ready, you put it into a model, you've trained it, you've got successful model accuracy. You're now deploying this into your environments and you want an endpoint for maybe real time um, inference uh, kind of possibility, or you're going to batch mode and process that through some Azure container instance or AKS with multiple containers if that is your requirement. So here's how we kind of go through and operationalize the model. Again, we've got a uh, machine learning web service we can deploy. There's all these steps that are defined and available inside of the machine learning service. I'm going to explore those very quickly. And finally, you're going to have the customer acceptance. So again, not going into a lot of detail right now at this phase in this session, but you will need to have a way of communicating how this thing's built, how it changes over time, how it's redeployed, how you support it, all this kind of great stuff. So you're going to have some documentation and some handover kind of steps to, to do that. Okay. We're going to come into the principal component analysis. We're not going to spend a great deal of time in kind of detailing out this because it can get very complicated and a lot of depth in this. So essentially, what we're going to do today, we're going to look at some notebooks that go through the PCA in theory, principal component analysis. We're going to show you how to prepare the data sets with some Jupyter notebooks and how we deploy PCA again in Jupyter notebooks. What we're trying to do is trying to kind of prepare the data set remove those nulls or, um, you know, kind of not a number of values, NAN, split off any description columns so we just have kind of numerical values that we can kind of process, normalize and centralize the data so we have it right. So we, when we fit the data into the model, it kind of does well and it can be done possibly. And we've got some, maybe some details around categorization in PCA. So these are the kind of things we're going to do inside of the, um, kind of modules, we're, uh, the demos are going to come up. Very quickly, we have something called the uh, kind of, well, PCA principal component um, analysis. And it's basically finding that kind of ellipses of the long axis and the short axis and how it fits that. And then kind of how we, then we carry that information. If we reduce the amount of data, data points in there, but we still want to constrain, constrain most of the kind of shape of that and get that right for us. So we want to predict our data into that space and then have those dimensions kind of give us the right input uh, data output. Okay, so let's look at preparing data sets. So we talked about this a little bit before, but we got the data cleaning, the feature selection, the data transforms, any feature engineering, that's the new variables from the features we may want to kind of divide and maybe some reduction in the size of the data set itself, so dimensionality reduction potentially. So some of the common tasks we might want to do is we're going to fill missing values. We're going to select features with different approaches that are available to us. We're going to work out what is the feature importance side, which are the key features that we have, which ones are most important. We need to scale that data with some normalization techniques. Transform maybe categories, uh, do something like with one hot encoding, for example, there's other techniques there. Transform numbers from cate into categories with say K bins, so kind of breaking it into maybe age groups, that kind of stuff. And dimensional reduction with PCA. So we're gonna look at the dimensional reduction in a little bit more detail um, as we go through the demos, but let's kind of uh, just have a quick look at what we have next. So, how many components are the minimum number of components that give us the kind of the maximum amount of information? So if we say you have a you know, hundred different columns, hundred features, what number can we get down to without minimum, without kind of losing the, the accuracy level? So we kind of work out where that kind of curve is 
and how many components. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with the principal component analysis is find that nice sweet spot of how many kind of maybe five, 10 different um, kind of features that are going to represent that, that cluster, that grouping much better. Um, kind of removing the kind of the stuff we don't really need to have in there to give us the accuracy we need. So we have um, a few different ways of approaching that, maybe value counts, potentially by different um, groupings, sorting by different columns, kind of figuring out where the grouping of data is, uh, etc. So we've got kind of that vertical line and that um, one that's kind of perpendicular to that, kind of where does it fit on that grouping there. So we're going to do some demos. We've only got a short amount of time left um, to go through the demos, but I'm going to give you the demos from one of the workshops I deliver from Microsoft, which is called the Reactors Group. Um, so I've got a number of machine learning kind of uh, different workshops I deliver, and I've given you the ones in here because essentially you can go and grab that content and also run through these examples yourself as well. Okay, so we're going to spin over to that. Um, when we come back, we'll be then going to uh, kind of end out the session, but let's go do the quick jump over now to the sessions uh, demos. Let me go um, do that. Hello, we're back. Okay, demo time. So we're going to uh, first give you the link to uh, the GitHub Microsoft forward slash reactors. And in there, there's a certain number of uh, workshops. And here are the workshops you can see for the data science and machine learning. And the one we're going to look at is the making your data useful for analysis. Going to here, we have the workshop materials, and inside of there, we have the three different Jupyter notebooks we're going to spend some time with. Well, firstly, maybe the first two, we're going to spend some time on those, but we're kind of, uh, if we have a little bit of time, we're going to look at third as one as well. So let's go look at the uh, environment. Well, what I've done is I've set up a Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Workspace. I'm not going to go through all the steps, we just don't have time, but if you spin one of those up, you'll have the machine learning space. And when you launch Studio, you'll then end up in the Studio here. So what I've done is I've gone and grabbed those uh, files and the data folders and put those in here. And you see that kind of a uh, data folder. We've got number one, joining data sets, number two, PCA, number three is the ROC curve, receiver operational curve. So we're going to look at number one first. And what I've done is I've gone into my notebooks. I've grabbed my notebook here and I'm loading that up, and then I'm going to launch that in Jupyter. So that's going to uh, keep the environment nice and clean for us. So we can focus in, I'm just editing Jupyter. And this one then is our Jupyter environment with our three files, a lot more space showing up here. And number one is going to be our Jupyter notebook. So I'm just going to restart that session to make sure I've got the kernel correctly connected. And if that's, I'm going to go back up to the top of the page here. So we kind of just do that. Okay, so this is cleaning that data set and getting it ready. So that first phase, what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through very quickly, and I mean quickly, I'm not gonna spend all the time reading all the instructions here, to kind of just demonstrate a little bit of the steps we're gonna do, okay. So we're gonna import pandas. This is a library to help us with creating data frames and kind of preparing the data and visualizing it. So we imported that. We've got some additional steps here. I'm just going to uh, kind of skim through those. This is uh, with the question mark, gives me ability to get some help. Um, I'm gonna skip through that. And again, uh, I can kind of get a bit more information about the pandas, but there's lots of help information on the help menu here. If you wanna go then Python or pandas or NumPy, or one of the other ones there, you'll see there's lots of information there. We're gonna load some data. So what we're gonna do here, we're going to use the PD pandas, read CSV. I'm reading that CSV and that CSV file is the data folder there. So if you look in the data folder, we have the CSV files here, okay. I'm going to go down and I'm reading it with the encoding Latin one because that solves a few problems um, that they read the instructions for more details there. We're going to look at the data. So we're going to use some of the uh, data frame commands like head and info and tail to see this. We're going to say head, we'll see the first five rows. For example, if I put uh, the number seven in there, I'm going to see, you guessed it, seven rows. Okay, so we see seven rows, 35 columns, lots of good data there. 
Info, this tells us a little bit about the column names, how many rows we have, how many columns we have, and some other information about the data types, etc. So mostly float 64 um, in there. Here we're going to see if there's any duplication in terms of the data. So here, using the question mark, we get the description of the command. And here we're going to run it with the open and close bracket to understand it's going to be false or true to say, is it duplicated with the previous values? So we want to sum up that. Zero means we have no duplication in there. That's excellent. Okay. We're going to do some um, additional kind of add-in. So we take the data and we're going to add it back onto itself. Okay. Right. So now we do a count. And we can see that we have, um, you know, the, there's two of those records. There's two of each of those records now. Okay, so we did a quick group by group by this value, give me a count, etc. So we want to remove the duplicates and we want to keep the last value. And we're going to do a check on that as well. Um, we've done that and we now have a index range that's kind of the second range. So we added it to the bottom and then we've got that kind of remove the first one. We've got the index range starting at the, the start of the second one going down. We want to maybe reset that. We can see the index starts at 8790. So let's kind of remove the duplicates if there's any there. None. Let's go and find uh, specific values. So we're also creating a data frame one, which is the first 35 columns, because we're using the semicolon and then 35 we're saying start and go to 35. Let's have a look at that. We have 35 columns, not 53, and we're basically giving us the first set. Now, this is mainly the descriptive columns, and then we have the numeric columns at the end. So we kind of want to remove some of those. So we're going to create another data frame, and we're going to also create it for just 2,000 rows. So we've got a bit of code here to do that. And we've defined the range of 35 to 53. So basically start after 35 and work your way forward. Let's have a look at the... Uh, details we have there. Now we have the numbers. We have the index value or the value of the row 1001102. Then have all the numbers rather than the text. Okay. So we're going to give a, a bit of info. 19 columns. Here you can see the values. And we're going to uh, see DF1 with the descriptive values. So we have DF1, DF2, we just kind of split it down, descriptive, non-descriptive numbers. We're going to re-index some stuff here. Oops, I managed to uh, break that a little bit. I think, uh, let's have a quick look. Index not found in that analysis. Um, oh, did I, oh, I missed it. What I did is I accidentally missed the step. Now I can go and run that second step. Okay, I've wondered why that did it. It did work the first time I tested it. Okay, do the same for number two. And what we're going to do here is we're going to output that data into a CSV file. Um, so NNDB1 CSV, encoded index. We want to also maybe just have a quick shape. Um, that's the number of rows and columns in each. So 8790 rows, 50, 35 columns, 2000 rows, 19 columns. And we're going to merge that. But remember, there's 2,000 on one side and 8,350 on the other, something like that. But now what we do is, because we've done a left join, we've got all the 8,000 odd, uh, 8,790 columns, rows of data, but we've only got 2,000 rows that are going to match that. Okay, so there's a few more kind of uh, steps on here, just looking at the data, um, examine it in a bit more detail, getting the, the tail and the head of the data. And there's some additional steps there to um, also do an inner join rather than left join. So here we have 2,000 rows, 8,790, 2,000, join them inner, you're going to get 2,000 only across both. So similar to like doing a view in SQL, that kind of stuff, we're, we're doing that with the data here. Again, we're getting the, the head and tail of the data. Um, and then we've got a final kind of set of steps, which is preparing the data for the next section, which will be the PCA section. So I'm just going to run a couple of these and basically create the output. So one's got a kind of a food group. 
which is basically the columns NDB number and the food group. So kind of just give me those values and make me a data set there. And let me look at the data set. So FG underscore DF is the food group underscore data frame. And we're now ready to kind of use that in the next section. So we're going to go to number two, PC8. Restart the kernel. So what I did is I, I ran these, shut them down and restarted them. So we have a clean run on this one. So this is the dimension reduction and principal component analysis steps. These are the kind of code. We kind of framed up what we're doing with the team data science process. We created and prepared our data. We're now going to run through some of the PCA stuff here. So we look down, we were explaining uh, kind of the, the scenario, what we're trying to do, what kind of problems we're trying to cover and more details again in the slides and, and information about the PCA and theory. So I have time to read through this. I'll give you the links to the uh, reactors workshop. You can go and grab this as well. But essentially we're trying to figure out the smallest number of data values that will give us that kind of shape of the model. So we can kind of put that in and still get a good accurate prediction out. So let's kind of import some modules. We're going to import pandas, numpy, skykit learn for decomposition and the pre-processing. So we've imported the PCA and the standard scalar. We need to all kind of process those steps and get this all working. We're going to read, uh, so let's go and run that. We're going to read our data into our data frame and give us a quick kind of outcome. So again, the 8989 number of uh, records there, 54 columns. And let's go and have a look at kind of the shape of that. So we have the number of columns, number of rows. We're going to, because of the type of processing that we're doing, with um, the data sets. We've got a bunch of nulls in there. Actually, let me go and have a quick look, look at that, kind of show you. Um, if I go back up a, a little steps and go to, I think I'm not actually showing it yet. Um, I did in the other set, data set. We've got all these columns here. There will be a bunch of nulls in some of these record values. Okay, so to do that, actually, let me just kind of quickly add in one and go, um, so we've got data frame. Okay, DF. Okay. So what we're going to do is we want to kind of see the, the data frame. If I scroll over to the very right, you'll see there's a bunch of NA values. That's going to cause us some problems unless we clear those out. So what I'm going to do is I want to handle the nulls right now. Okay. So I'm going to do the drop NA command, which is going to uh, remove any rows that have the NA or nulls in them. Okay, now let me look at my shape. How many rows do I have left? 2,190, excellent. Actually, if you look, there's kind of a, those numbers are uh, defined there. So we're now gonna create some different data sets. One is the descriptive data frame, which is going to create those kind of uh, first few columns and then the last kind of, uh, and then the ones that we need. So we kind of just build up that data frame. So here we've got the food group, short description, and some um, other information that is kind of descriptive type. So how many teaspoons of X, Y, Z. Now we've got that, we want to kind of do a nutrition data frame, which is just the numerical data. So again, what we're doing here, we've got um, some food group and short description. So we want to kind of clean some of this up, up here. You know, kind of, there's our, our kind of numerical data values. So we're going to remove the food group and short description columns. We're going to take this one out and this one out. Okay, so we're just doing a quick drop on that. Now we review, uh, we check that. We reset on our index and we can actually look at the data again. And we can see now we just got the number and all of the numerical columns. So the data set's now ready for us to perform some PCA on it. We want to normalize the data first. Let's actually look at what we have in a histogram in order to make sure that we understand the data a little better. And we use something called the box cot um, in order to transformation in order to do this. Let's go down and see this uh, process. Give this a moment or two to process now. And here you can see that we have uh, some breakdown, but 
only some of the boxes are really filled in and it doesn't have that kind of bell curve that we're really looking for. So we're going to do um, some processing on this. So one of the things we can do is kind of um, add a one to the values in each column. Okay, now we kind of want to use, we're going to use the Skippy uh, stats inbox, uh, box cot rather, import box cot here to do this. I won't go through all the details, but essentially we run this and then have a look at that. Let's look at what, what kind of outcome in terms of kind of the histograms that we have uh, again. So just have a quick look at that. Remember we kind of added that one to the values kind of to, to just kind of rearrange it a little bit and get a bit, a bit better. We're starting to get a few of the bell curves now, but there's a few kind of that are not quite right still. Um, so we want to do some scaling on the data, get us through kind of the information there. So we've done that. Uh, let's kind of make sure that we have we don't want NAN here. If you see NAN rather than zero, you're going to have to go back and clean those duplicates. Let's just, um, if we want to find the standardized deviation, uh, we, we could use the uh, deviation commands. But here we're going to fit now the model with the data. Okay, so let's kind of do that. And let's look at the plot. So here we have our collapse kind of, remember that kind of that line going through each direction, each dimension, kind of that's where this one kind of literally goes through kind of the, the middle of that one and then down. So we're going to want to understand where we kind of have the, the curve here, the elbow essentially of that data. And we want to understand that and see, um, say the first five uh, values, what's the ratio then of the variance of data values that exists in the data set based on the first five highest kind of um, components. And we're going to um, get an array of those values. Again, we won't have time to go through all that, but basically we're seeing um, increasing the six components would cover an additional three data points that um, over the first five. So maybe five, six is gonna, gonna be around the kind of the sweet spot of kind of the elbow there, how many we need to get the accuracy that Let's kind of do a, a graph of that. And we can see we've got the cumulative explained variance graph here. Um, again, we want to kind of get it into the top corner as best we can. And we're going to do some additional kind of analysis on the values then. So each row, what the first five values are and what the kind of um, the component values of each one of those are. So remember we've, we found those value columns, the first best five. And here we can then kind of see if we kind of drop some additional columns out of our data set. So we can kind of do a, a final um, kind of correlation of the values and then we can interpret results. We're going to do a, a kind of value of all of these columns here. You can see kind of that there's a lot of values there. And we want to put the values in. So we've kind of uh, done an adjustment of those values there. And we've got a final kind of key k-means model, which is going to be our clustering in this case around that. We've got an array, and then we're going to create our data frame that's going to allow us to understand those five key values for that. And we want to explore that cluster and see what the top, uh, say the first uh, cluster group. Then we have maybe um, additional clusters here the second cluster and the third cluster here. So again, we're, we're going through very fast in terms of the data here, um, the analysis, but we want to be able to kind of figure all out. And there is going to be a final one that will, and I'll kind of just um, literally run it to get it to run all of the cells. So it kind of goes through very quickly so you can kind of see the results of the um, outcome of that. So it's kind of building it through now and we'll build all the different algorithms and matrices and everything else and what we end up with is a curve at the end that's going to show us the receiver operating characteristic metric 90.97 97% I'm thinking that's probably a pretty good high accurate curve there well look folks that is going to be the end of today's session we're going to do the uh, go back to the slide deck for a certain moment now for the sad part we're end of the session I know there's a bunch of excellent sessions coming up so don't worry you can go straight into another one 
Big special thanks to Microsoft for supporting Data Platform Geeks and SQL Server Geeks and the community initiatives. Big thanks to everyone involved, all the speakers, organizers, helpers, and for you being part of that from the audience as well. So it's been a special thanks for me for joining my session. And don't forget, there's free ways to win prizes. Don't forget to post your selfie with the hashtag DPS2020. Give us your session feedback. I do personally want to know how you saw this session, how well it kind of performed for you. Let me know and go and visit the sponsors and exhibitors. They've done an amazing effort this year to make that available for you. So go and jump on that and get some tweets out there. Follow the Data Geeks and DA, Data AI Summit. And for me, it's a sign off for this year and I will see you very soon. Thank you very much. And if you want to get onto my YouTube channel, it's called Data Plus Train. Data Plus Train. Okay, so I will see you guys very, very soon. Bye.